if you are bald <laughs> or going bald, you might have just found your new favorite story in the Bible. It's a strange story, isn't it? And don't worry, we'll, we'll get there. Uh, my name is Adam. If we haven't met, I'm part of the team here, and it's uh, really great to have you with us today. Uh, today, we are kicking off a brand new sermon series in the book of 2 Kings. Now, I want to set it up by asking you, have you ever watched Air Crash Investigation? Now, I can't say I've ever watched it myself, uh, but it's a TV show that's been around for a long time. It uh, started in 2003. Uh, there's been 240 episodes across 24 seasons, and it's still going. Who knew air crashes were so popular? Now, the point of the show is, as the title suggests, to investigate air crashes. Uh, they, they look into what went wrong, and they, they try to see if it could have been prevented. And the reason I tell you about this is because this is kind of what is happening in 2 Kings. 2 Kings is an investigation into a disaster. See, the book of 2 Kings, not to give too much away, but the book ends with a catastrophe. The temple in Jerusalem, that the place of God's dwelling, is in ruins. The people of God have been taken into exile in Babylon and Assyria. It seems like all hope is lost. And the question as we get to the end of the book, the question as we stand in the rubble is, how could this happen? How could God have allowed this to happen? How could he have allowed the temple to be destroyed, his people to be taken into exile? How did we get to this point? How did the wheels fall off so badly? And the book of 2 Kings is intended to show us the answer. It's intended to show us in vivid detail how this disaster came about. Now, I know what you're thinking. Sounds like a really happy book. Can't wait to study the book of 2 Kings. Now, the truth is, this book is in the Bible for a reason. We need the book of 2 Kings like we need all other books of the Bible. You know, Romans, the book of Romans in the New Testament, it says this, chapter 15, verse 4. Uh, Paul writes and he says, For everything that was written in the past, referring to the Old Testament predominantly, everything that was written in the past was written, what? To teach us. Second Kings teaches us some vital lessons about living a life of faith. None of us in this room wants to crash the airplane of our faith. None of us wants our lives to end in disaster. And 2 Kings is going to help us avoid that fate. Now, we haven't randomly uh, selected 2 Kings for this term. This is actually the culmination of a bit of a journey uh, that we've been on. Uh, we've been looking at a particular part of the Old Testament for a number of years now. Uh, the, we've been looking at the rise and the fall of Israel's kings. Uh, I'm sure you know Israel is the, the chosen people of God. God chose them out of all nations to be his, his treasured possession, his special people. Uh, initially, they were 12 uh, loosely connected tribes, but eventually they asked for a king to rule over them. Uh, this is what we see in books like 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel and 1 Kings and 2 Kings. And we've been working our way through these books over the last few years. Uh, back in 2018, um, which I'm sure we all remember like it was yesterday, uh, we looked at the book of 1 Samuel. Uh, then in 2019, we looked at the book of 2 Samuel. Uh, they, those books tell us about the, the reign of King David, especially. And we took a, a couple of years break, and, and uh, in 2022, we looked at the first half of 1 Kings. Our series was called The Rise and Fall of Solomon. Uh, Solomon was David's son and his heir to the throne. Uh, and then last year, we looked at the second half of First Kings in, in a series called The Life and Times of Elijah. Now, you might remember Elijah was not a king. He was a prophet. And so he spoke God's word to God's people and especially to Israel's kings. He warned them about forgetting God and forsaking his law, which is exactly what had begun to happen and which is exactly what we see happening in Second Kings. 
This is why we've called this series Faith in Faithless Times. This is what's happening in this book. The people of God, led by their terrible kings, have become faithless. They've forgotten God, they've forsaken his law, they've become a faithless people. Now, there are some bright spots along the way. Uh, We'll see some revivals with uh, men like Josiah and Hezekiah. uh, But really, on the whole, these are dark days. And it leads to a disastrous end, as we'll see throughout the book. Now, today, we're going to begin the story by looking at chapter 2. You can um, study chapter 1 in your own time or in your life groups, but we really see a key event take place in chapter 2. And and let me just encourage you, like I encouraged you at the start of the Revelation series, it would be great for you to read the book of 2 Kings this term. Um, If you're uh, not reading the Bible at the moment, well, There you go. There's your invitation to read the book of 2 Kings. Read it before church. Um, It's going to be helpful for you as we study this book. Uh, Make sure you grab one of the series guides, which has some resources to help you as we study this book together. And so we're going to look at chapter 2 under three headings. There's three main movements, three main stories that we see in this chapter. The first, if you're taking notes, is the changing of the guard, verses 1 to 18. Now, I have some uh, good news for you. If you weren't aware, tomorrow is a public holiday. It's the king's birthday, uh, which still, I don't know about you, but it's still a little bit strange to say. After all, it was the queen's birthday for 70 years. Uh, Queen Elizabeth II reigned from 1952 until her death in 2022. And, And when she passed away, she passed the crown to her son, King Charles. Now, for many people um, in Australia and and England and other parts of the Commonwealth, this was a a moment of sadness. Uh, It was a moment of uncertainty. It always is when there is a transition of leadership, especially if it's been a much-loved and long-serving leader like Queen Elizabeth. And something similar is happening here in 2 Kings. This is really the main point of this chapter, the transition from Elijah to Elisha. Their names are really similar just to keep us on our toes, I think. See, Elijah was God's prophet, God's spokesperson, and Elisha was his protege, his apprentice. Now, Elijah had been God's prophet for many years, and he'd had a very powerful, very influential ministry. Uh, He confronted powerful kings like King Ahab. Uh, He confronted the false prophets of Baal. You might remember the God contest on Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18. Uh, Elijah had a very powerful, very influential ministry. He's one of Israel's greatest ever prophets. And this is why uh, what's about to happen is such a big deal. Elijah is about to leave. Verse 1. The Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind. And so the great prophet of Israel is about to go. And as you can imagine, this was incredibly upsetting, especially for Elisha. And this is what we see play out in these verses. You see, Elijah and Elisha, they go on this final journey, one last hurrah, one last trip. Uh, They go from Bethel uh, to Jericho and then across the Jordan River. Now, uh, each time they arrive in one of these towns, the other prophets who are in these towns seem to be aware of what is happening. Maybe someone put something in the prophet's Facebook group, I don't know, but word has gotten out that Elijah is about to depart. And so each time they arrive in these towns, these other prophets say to Elisha, don't you know that your master is about to leave you today? And he's like, yeah, I know. Thanks for reminding me. Like, be quiet. He's upset about this. And he also knows what this means for him. He knows that he is Elijah's replacement. God had already told Elijah uh, to anoint Elisha as his successor. This is why Elisha had spent the last number of years alongside Elijah, learning from him, uh, walking alongside him, living with him. And Elisha knows that he is about to receive the baton. And this is why he won't leave Elijah's side. Now, it's really interesting, but each time they get to these towns, uh, Elijah says to Elisha, well, 
I'm going to keep going. Why don't you stay here? Why don't you take it easy? I'll, I'll go on to the next town. And, and each time, Elisha's like, no way. I'm not leaving you. I'm staying with you. And, and most scholars believe that this is like one final test. One final test of Elisha's willingness to accept this role. One final test to confirm his commitment to his calling to be Israel's prophet. And Elisha passes with flying colours. He sticks with Elijah. He goes uh, with him through the Jordan River. Elijah actually parts the the waters of the Jordan. He he strikes his cloak and the waters part. and, And this should remind us of the Exodus, you know, when Moses led Israel out of slavery. Um, it's it's a, a picture that Elijah is a leader like Moses. He's a prophet like Moses. He's a significant figure. And, and when they get over to the other side of the Jordan, Elijah says to Elisha, verse 9, tell me what I can do for you before I am taken from you. One last request. And Elisha says, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Now, Elisha is not asking to be twice as good as Elijah. I want to be double the prophet you are, Elijah. Now, in that day, the oldest son would receive a double portion of the inheritance, which as an oldest son is a practice I think we should bring back. You see, Elisha is formally asking to be Elijah's heir, to receive his ministry. And that's exactly what happens next. They're walking along the road, they're talking together, and Elisha sees a vision of chariots and horsemen, and Elijah is then taken up into heaven in a whirlwind. Uh, One of only two people in the Bible not to taste death, Enoch being the other one in Genesis 5. And as Elisha looks at this, he cries out, my father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. Now, Elisha's not describing what he sees here. He's not describing the vision. Look at the the chariots and horsemen. He's actually describing Elijah. This is like Elijah's nickname. He's the chariots and the horsemen of Israel because he's the defender of Israel. He's been the the, uh, true army of God's people because he's spoken God's true word to them. And now he's leaving. And it's a sad day. And this is why Elisha cries out. This is why he tears his clothes. It's a sign of sadness and mourning. But it's also not a a totally hopeless day. Because the fact is, while Elijah may be gone, God is not. While Elijah may have departed, God has not. We see that very clearly in the next few verses. Verse 13. Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left and he crossed over. Now remember what happened earlier, verse seven and eight. Elijah parted the waters of the Jordan. And now Elisha is doing exactly the same thing. The point is that Elisha has Elijah's cloak. He has Elijah's power because he is in Elijah's position. He has inherited Elijah's ministry. I mean, the answer to his question, where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah? The answer is, he's with Elisha. He's at work through Elisha. And this is what the other prophets who see this uh, happen. This is what they acknowledge. Verse 15. The company of the prophets from Jericho who were watching said, the spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. And they went to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. And the point is this, God's worker may be gone, but God's work goes on. God's prophet may have left, but God's presence has not. God is still at work in the world. God's word continues to go out. And there is such an important lesson here for us. It is a reminder that God's work in the world is not tied to any particular person. God's power is not limited to any particular era. There is no such thing as the good old days in God's kingdom. There is no such thing as an indispensable leader. There is no such thing as an irreplaceable person. God's work continues to go on in the world. No matter who comes, no matter who goes. In fact, 
at Westminster Abbey in London, uh, maybe some of you have been there, there's a memorial uh, to the two brothers, John and Charles Wesley. Uh, John Wesley, Charles Wesley, two of the most influential leaders in church history. And there's a quote from John and from Charles on this memorial. And the quote from John is, is simply this, the best of all is that God is with us. The best of all is God is with us. And the quote from Charles, God buries his workmen, but carries on his work. And those two quotes perfectly capture what this section is about. The best of all is that God is with us. Not this person or that person, not John Piper or Tim Keller or Rick Warren or Adam or Ben or anyone else. The best of all is that God is with us. And he will always be with us. He'll never leave us. He'll never let us down. Not even when leaders move on. Not even when loved ones pass away. God is always at work in the world. God buries his workmen but carries on his work. And I think this can fill us with hope and with courage. You know, as we look at the state of our world, as we look at the direction of our culture, it could be easy for us to become discouraged, to despair, to want to go back to the good old days, to think that we just need another Billy Graham. And it's easy for us to forget that God has not left us, that God is still with us, that he's at work in the world, that his word continues to go out. And he's not scared. He's not shocked. He's not short on resources. His work goes on and his word goes out. And amazingly, you and I get to be part of what he's doing. Now, it doesn't depend on us, thank God, but it does involve us. And so why wouldn't you give your life to this? Why would you spend your life chasing toys and trinkets when you could be part of what God is doing in the world? Changing lives. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah? The question is in this text, well, through the finished work of Christ and through the, the power of the Holy Spirit, he is with us. He's with us in our day for his glory. This is the lesson that we get from this first section of the story, the changing of the guard. But Elisha then moves on from the Jordan River and he returns to Jericho. And this leads to our second point, which is the miracle of mercy. See, after Elijah crosses over the Jordan River, he goes back to Jericho and he stays there for a little while and he discovers that there's a problem in Jericho. Look at verse 19. The people of the city said to Elisha, look, our Lord, and you can see that their respect for Elisha and the way that they address him. Look, our Lord, this town is well situated, as you can see. But the water is bad and the land is unproductive. Now, this is quite a tame translation. It's not just that the water tastes bad. It's that the water is bad. It's, it's foul. We even see verse 21. It's causing death. Crops aren't growing. Animals aren't healthy. Even babies aren't being born. There's something lethal in this water supply. And so they come to Elisha and ask for his help. Now, Elisha says, OK, well, bring me a new bowl and put some salt in it. Seems pretty strange. It seems pretty ordinary. I mean, it's, you know, it's just a bowl with some salt. What good is that going to do? And that's exactly the point. You see, this water is not going to be healed by some kind of hocus pocus. It's going to be healed by the power of God's word through the mouthpiece of Elisha. It's exactly what happens. Elisha throws the salt into the spring. He declares that God has healed the water. And we're told that it's remained pure to this day. It's another example that God is at work through Elisha. Now, this seems like a pretty simple story on the surface, doesn't it? It seems pretty, um, pretty straightforward, but there's more to it than meets the eye. In fact, I would suggest that we should be as shocked by this story as we are at the next one. You know, we're shocked by the boys and the bears, but this story is equally as shocking. Why? Well, where are we? Where is Elisha? He's in Jericho. What happened at Jericho? I'm sure you, you know the story when God's people entered the promised land, the first uh, city that they came across was Jericho. 
And so they marched around the walls of the city. The walls came tumbling down and Jericho was left in ruins. Now, after Jericho was destroyed, Joshua, the leader of God's people, he declared that Jericho was to never be rebuilt. He uttered a curse on anyone who would rebuild Jericho. Uh, It was to remain in ruins as a reminder of God's judgment. Well, what happened? 500 years later in 1 Kings 16, under the reign of evil King Ahab, when no one gave a rip about God's word, a man named Heel rebuilt Jericho. And Jericho became a city under a curse. But what's happened now that God's prophet has come to town? What's happened now that God's word has come to this city? They have received God's grace. They have received healing. The place of curse has become a place of blessing. And this is a beautiful picture of what God does and who God is. I love the way Dale Ralph Davis puts it in his commentary. He says, is this incident not a cameo of God's own character? See how he delights to turn the most curse-ridden, sin-laden, judgment-bearing situations into episodes of his grace in living colour. It seems too good to be true and too much for sane sinners to hope for. But it is the testimony of this text. God's word through God's prophet brings God's grace even to Jericho. And I would add, even to you, even to me. I mean, isn't this a picture of the gospel that because of what Christ has done, we who are under the curse of sin and death, we can now receive God's blessing and grace. And it doesn't matter where we find ourselves, no matter how far we are from God, no matter how ruined our life might have become, no matter how cursed we might feel, no matter how lost we might be, there is grace available to anyone, even to Jericho, even to you, even to me. And all we have to do is ask. All we have to do is say, help. I mean, just reflect on your own heart and your own life for a moment. Think about those things that you're most ashamed of. Those things that that keep you awake at night. Those things that, that are in the darkest places of your heart. If you confess them to God, if you bring them to him, he doesn't turn away in disgust. He doesn't throw them in your face. He buries them in the depths of the ocean. He removes them from you. He cleanses your record. He cleanses you. This is what he does. This is who he is. And and so I just want to say to you, don't be afraid to turn to him. Don't be afraid to bring to him your sin and your suffering and your shame. We think we have to run away from God, clean ourselves up and then come back to him. But it's actually only by bringing ourselves to him, our real selves, our whole heart, that we can find true cleansing in him. It's what he's purchased for us on the cross. So don't run away from God, run to him. He's ready to receive you. This strange story at Jericho is a miracle of mercy. But it's not the end of the story. There's one more story in this chapter. And it shows us that God offers mercy to all. God's mercy is available to anyone. But if you reject his mercy, you will face his judgment. Which brings us to this third story, the judgment of mockers. This story of the the 42 boys being mauled by two bears for mocking a bald guy. I mean, I bet many of you didn't even know this was in the Bible. Now, Now, given the way my hairline is going, I say they got what they deserved. I'm kidding. I mean, what is the point of this story? Because it is strange. It is terrible. Well, like the last story in Jericho, there is more here than meets the eye. I mean, first of all, where are we? 
location, location, location. Uh, well, we see verse 23, Elisha has now moved on to Bethel. Now, the word Bethel literally means house of God. And, and indeed, in earlier years, Bethel was home to the Ark of the Covenant, the, the symbol of God's presence among his people. Uh, before Jerusalem, before the temple, Bethel was the place of God's presence. But that was a long time ago. And in more recent years, Bethel has become the home of idol worship. Bethel has become the heart of false religion. There's uh, statues to false gods. There's shrines of, of golden calves. I mean, Bethel had gone a long way off the rails. And this explains the welcoming party that Elisha receives in Bethel. He is walking along the road outside the city and a group of boys come out of the town um, to meet him. A probably 10 to 16 years old, and there's a lot of them. There's at least 42, probably many more. This is a large group of young men, probably like a bit like a gang, and they've come to intimidate Elisha. You know, this is not a chance meeting. They didn't kind of randomly run into Elisha in the street. They saw him, and they've come out of the town to confront him and to pick a fight with him. And they say to him, verse 23, get out of here, baldy. Now, why do they focus on Elijah's chrome dome? You know, what's what's the big deal with with his baldness? Well, it could be uh, because Elijah was known to be a hairy guy. And so they could be saying, well, you've got nothing on Elijah. You're an imposter. You're nothing like him. Or it could be uh, just a juvenile insult. They could just be mocking him. Whatever the case is, the point is clear. They want nothing to do with him. They show total contempt for him. They want to get rid of him. Now remember who Elisha is. He's not just your average Joe. He is God's chosen prophet. He is God's spokesperson. He is God's mouthpiece. And so this mockery of Elisha is a mockery of God. This rejection of Elisha is a rejection of God. They are effectively saying, we don't want you, we don't want your God, we don't want his word, so get out of here. Go away. We're not interested. And the result of this intentional, hard-hearted rejection is judgment. Elijah calls down a curse on these boys, and 42 of them are mauled by two bears. It's a devastating picture of God's judgment. Now, it's interesting to compare what happened in Jericho with the water to what happens here in Bethel. I mean, there's there's not a great deal of difference between the two cities. Uh, They're both places marked by rebellion. They both deserve God's judgment. And yet Jericho receives mercy while Bethel receives judgment. Why? The answer is simple, but so important. Jericho asked for help, admitted their need. Bethel said, get lost, go away, get out of here, not interested. Jericho listened to God's word, Bethel rejected it. Jericho humbled themselves before God, Bethel did not. And the same is still true for us today. I mean, the question is, What about you? What's your attitude to God's prophet? Will you listen to God's prophet? You might think, well, where is God's prophet today? Where can I hear God's word today? And the answer is through Jesus. Through Jesus' words in the Bible. Jesus, of course, is the ultimate prophet. He's the one to whom Elisha was pointing because he speaks God's word to us. He has the words of eternal life. But of course, Jesus does even more. Jesus is the word of God. He's the exact representation of God's being. He is the word made flesh. He is God with us. And so the question for every single one of us is, uh, am I listening to Jesus? What is my attitude to Jesus? Jesus came into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world. His arms are open to all who would come to him, even to Jericho, even to you, even to me. But if you reject him, 
if you don't want his mercy, if you despise his word, then God's wrath remains on you. God's judgment remains ahead of you. The question that this chapter forces us to answer is what is my response to Jesus? Am I like Jericho? Am I humble myself before him? Am I listening to him? Have I come to him with my need? Or have I rejected him? Despised him? Wanted nothing to do with him? What's your response to Jesus? There is mercy for all who would come to him, even to Jericho, even to you, even to me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it speaks to us about eternal things. And the most important question we could ever answer is what is my response to Jesus? He has come from heaven to earth to extend mercy and grace. And Lord, we can receive it simply by saying, help. And so Lord, help us, all of us, to turn to Jesus. Help all of us to to put our trust in Jesus, to live for Jesus. There is joy and safety and salvation and refuge to be found in him. Lord, thank you for the miracle of mercy that is the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Can I invite you to stand as we respond by singing and as I leave you with these words from Numbers chapter six. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.